Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, on today's show, we're going to be discussing the ethical dimensions to Stoic thought and practice. And I thought, while I was studying for the show, I came across a really interesting little essay by uh, Rear, Admir Rear Admiral James Bond Stockdale. Uh, some people might remember him as a uh, vice, presidential, pre, a vest, vice presidential candidate uh, during the 90s, and he was kind of seen as a doddering old man. But back in his day, he was a uh, quite a uh, quite a man. He was a war hero, and he spent seven and a half years in a prisoner of war camp uh, during the Vietnam War. And one interesting thing about his life is that. Uh, he had, up to that point, his experience in the Vietnam War, he had numerous years of experience uh, in the Navy and as a fighter pilot. And he had returned to college, university, to, in order to earn ranks. I'm not exactly sure why, but in order to pursue, pursue his education. And he got so bored with all of the typical stuff that he was supposed to study that he just decided to go walk and just take a flight and see what was uh, see what the philosophy department had to offer, and it was there that he became he fell in love with Epictetus, if that's how you pronounce his name. It might it might be Epictetus? But Epictetus. I'm not I'll go. Quite we sure. can go with that. Uh, who was a Roman slave uh, turned Stoic philosopher, and his handbook has you know survived generations and was even included um, by anti-Stoics as being canon for you know Platonic and you know, various other philosophical schools because of the numerous brilliant insights it had into how to handle yourself in horrendous uh, circumstances. So he fell in love with this book and he memorized it, he read it, he studied, and by the time the Vietnam War came around, he learned um, firsthand what Epictetus was talking about. And he decided, to, after his experience, he wrote a book called uh, Courage Under Fire, Stoic Doctrine in the Laboratory of Human Behavior, I believe. And in that book, he discusses the uh, many of the most important things uh, that we're probably going to be talking about today, uh, a number of them being how to handle yourself under severe duress. And you know, we're not going to be giving, obviously, pointers on how to do that, but we'll be discussing, you know, <laughs> examples. Um, how to survive waterboarding. No, but he, the thing is, is that he understood the you know, subjectively, what it meant to lose your station in life and to one day be a rear admiral or a, you know, a commander of hundreds of, of pilots in one of the most powerful militaries in the world to being, as he described it, um, a weeping, sobbing, shameful uh, prisoner, uh, you know, covered in mud and a shame to even call yourself an American after being tortured. And, you know, he was tortured repeatedly for a number of years. And, he, but throughout this experience, uh, towards the end, he grew in such a tremendous way that he was able to create a network of prisoners that, um, that that ran kind of counter propaganda uh, warfare against the Vietnamese, uh, the Vietnamese army, who would record their, uh, you know, their confessions. They would they would torture them until they confessed how evil American capitalism was and this and that. And that was one of the big things that you know American soldiers would feel ashamed about, not even wanting to talk to their fellow captive um, countrymen because you know, hey, you know, I you, I'm a traitor, you know. But uh, over time they developed a system where they would give fake names to the Vietnamese as if they were, you know, you know, these serious individuals uh, doing this, you know, like Clark Kent is, you know, what went down over the Pacific or, you know, this or that. And then the, when the Vietnamese would air this propaganda, they, they would get backlash because it was so clearly obvious that they had been fooled by these prisoners. But over seven and a half uh, years uh, in this situation, he came to he tested uh, Stoic doctrine, and he found it to be 100% um, critical in terms of living, living life 
in a way that retained human integrity and your own personal dignity, even in situations where it would seem to any other person that it would be impossible to do uh, such a thing. So that is, you know, just to start out just by kind of laying the groundwork for, you know, this this whole school of thought, this whole system, this whole way of thought is, um, it works, you know, quite interestingly enough. And, you know, from there, do you have any thoughts there, Harrison? Well, I want to give a bit of background before we get into some of the, some of the actual specifics of what Stoics do. Mm -hmm. As last week we were we talked a bit about the history of Stoicism and you know how it developed in uh, and like you mentioned out of the the Socratic school and um, you know Zeno was the first um, I believe yeah Zeno was the first mm-hmm. Stoic that developed the Stoic system and then it kind of went through several permutations after that and eventually to become one of the kind of predominant philosophies in the Roman Empire um, to the point where Marcus Aurelius was a, was a Stoic one of the one of the Roman empires, emperors, but to, just to give a, a background on, to well, to give a background and to re-emphasize the importance of practice and ethics to to Stoics, there's a bit, um, well, there's a quote that's applicable, but it comes not from a not from a Stoic, but from an Epicurean, um, Epicurus himself, because like I said last week, there were numerous philosophical schools in, uh, you know, ancient Greece and Rome. And some of them had some things in common, but they each kind of like, you know, they'd all start their own system when, when they'd branch off from their teacher. And so there were similarities. So this is what Epicurus had to say about, um, about philosophy in general. So he said, vain is the word of a philosopher, which does not heal any suffering of man. For just as there is no profit in medicine if it does not expel the, the diseases of the body, so there is no profit in philosophy either if it does not expel the suffering of the mind. So this is a quote included in the book I mentioned last week by William B. Irvine, A Guide to the Good Life, which came out um, several years ago. It's pretty new, 2009, so 10 years old now. Um, and like I, like I mentioned then too, Stoicism has um, experienced a resurgence in recent years to the point where there are s- entire Stoic websites and tons of books and meetups of people who are actually engaging with Stoicism in this way and pr- pretty much reinvigorating it as a lived, um, a lived philosophy. Because like Irvine himself points out, you no longer go to a philosopher to learn how to live. Like you, the, the philosophies that are taught in universities, which is pretty much the only place you learn philosophy, is strictly academic and theoretical. You learn the systems, you learn the logic, you learn who said what and when, and um, you place it into a historical context, but you don't actually learn um, a way of living. And that's what the philosophers of this time were all about. Uh, that's what the Stoics were all about, was to actually learn how to live and to be instructed on how to live. So... That was really the primary reason, Irvine argues, for Stoic philosophy at the time was to learn how to, how to live, how to deal with negative emotions, for instance. Um, he, one way he puts it, uh, they went on to develop techniques for preventing the onset of negative emotions and for extinguishing them when attempts at prevention f- uh, prevailed. So it was a, a system and a practice that was directly a- applicable that was to be put into practice in, everyday, in your everyday life. So for, for things as simple as, um, you know, feeling, uh, well, experiencing those basic negative emotions like jealousy and anger and hate and, um, and, and things like that, that we, that most people don't like experiencing or that lead to bad consequences usually as a result when they're not, um, when they come up automatically, when they express themselves automatically, when they basically possess you. Because like we mentioned a couple weeks ago on our show on breathing, we are machines in a in a sense. We're automatons in most cases where something happens in our environment. Something happens with um, maybe it's our, our partner or one of our family members or our friends that just sets us off that uh, an emotion that triggers something within us that we then automatically 
play through certain action patterns and, and things that usually only make things worse. And then we end up regretting it afterwards. Or if we don't regret it, we just act like, you know, total a-holes and then everyone hates us and we don't know why, or we're not even aware that they know that we're not even aware that they think we're, you know, total jerks. And eventually it comes to a point, hopefully where you realize this and you, you know, ex you have an experience of yourself, a view of yourself that where, where you see yourself as others see you and you realize how, you know, how much you've failed to live up to the person you think you are and the person you actually could be. Mm -hmm. So that's really what the, what the Stoics were trying to and successfully to some degree um, to bring about in the people that were learning the Stoic way of life. It's how not to be a jerk in one sense. Here, I, just on that topic, I want to read a quote by, Epi, uh, how did we agree to pronounce him? Epictetus. Epictetus. All right, he says, uh, this is one of the, the things that one of his students said. So-and-so, says someone, is already able to read Chrysippus all by himself. It is fine, headway by the gods that you are making, man, Epictetus says. Great progress this is. The student responds, why do you mock him? And why do you try to divert him? And then uh, Epictetus responds, and why do you try to divert him from the consciousness of his own shortcomings? Are you not willing to show him the work of virtue that he may learn where to look for his progress? Look for it there, wretch, where your work lies. And where is your work? In desire and aversion, that you may not miss what you desire and encounter what you would avoid. In choice and in refusal, that you may commit no fault fault therein. So that's the attitude, the basic attitude, is that no matter how good you are or how, or how smart you are, that, you know, the, the work in philosophy is in becoming virtuous and seeing how big of a wretch you really are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a... You, uh, a philosophy professor these days would probably get fired for <laughs> speaking in such a way to a, a poor, fragile university student. Oh, yeah. You know? Um <laughs> Which just shows the, you know, I mentioned that the, the one of the goals of engaging in philosophy of this sort is to come to the place where you realize what a wretch you are in yourself. But it really shows what a, what a state of uh, wretchedness the our entire culture is in, where we are so reticent and like hesitant to engage in that kind of truthful speech about others and about ourselves, primarily about ourselves. But to when you look at that exchange, like the exchange is to give an objective view of oneself, you know, to basically have someone point out to you that you're being, um, you're, you're being totally full of yourself. You're, you're being an arrogant snob and, and uh, just behaving in a fairly reprehensible manner. People need to be told that every once in a while. Everyone needs to be told that every once in a while. But, and chances are you will be told that on Twitter, you know, occasionally. <laughs> but the, there's no, it's not, it, ne never is it in a framework that's actually constructive. Mm -hmm. we, like, we, we lack that kind of school in our, our culture these days for really the instruction of, of moral virtue, of, of character building, of, of being told by someone who actually has your best interests at heart of your shortcomings because the the type of abuse that goes on on Twitter is is never like pedagogical it's never <laughs> educational it's never with your best interests at heart it's just like you're it's just it's insults. a bar brawl yeah, it's just a bar brawl <laughs> but i think for for a lot of people like who <laughs> experiencing something like that for the first time will will be naturally um will naturally feel negative emotions mm -hmm. at being told off, you know, being, being, having one's, um, you know, true nature revealed in such a bare bones and blunt manner. But that is really where it all starts because you can't, you can't change yourself. You can't, be, you can't become something greater than you are right now without realizing where you are right now, without realizing what a wretched state you are in at the moment, because, that's what you that's what you need in order to to become something new is to realize that there's nothing very good about where you are right now that that needs to be the the kind of fuel that propels you into um into having an ideal for something greater so you have to realize how low you are right now um to to have a vision of yourself at a at a higher level at a you know 
at a level at a, at a level of character and 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 being that is at least somewhat worthy of being called a human being um because most people are not at that level um or at least Epictetus had the ability to offer the next step. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, slamming someone on Twitter was pointless unless you can offer something better. Right. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, you might say he had the right to say what he was saying. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's an important point, too, is that mo- most abuse and insults come from people who have who themselves have no right to give it <laughs> because they're just as wretched as the people that they're uh, you know insulting and pointing out the the shortcomings of. Mm-hmm. But that uh, that leads to, um, for me at least, to some of the actual practical advice for living in the world. One of which, in Irvine's book, is um, how does he call it? He calls it something like. Um, Uh, I can't remember what he's got a phrase for it, but we'll get into it. But basically, one of the one of the techniques he shows because this book, like I said, it's like a guidebook for modern Stoic living. And he, in part two, is where he lays out the the Stoic psychological techniques, as he calls them. And the one that I want to talk about is uh, I don't even know where it is. Uh, the things it might be fatalism. Um. Well, you guys, you guys say something while I find it because. I <laughs> All right. Well, you know, you're talking about uh, just constructive, practical advice, and there is, uh, there is like the psychology of the Stoics is a lot like cognitive behavioral therapy. It's very, um, it's very cognitive. I mean, it really, when you get down to it, and it's designed to offer practical, practical help because in their theory, you know, for for animals, there are basically two steps before for acting there's you get an impression i'm hungry and then there's the impulse go find food well for humans there is there are more steps and then they've been elaborated on by you know stoic philosophers they or they were elaborated on by stoic philosophers so i'm not exactly sure how many stages there ended up being but i know of at least at least four so that you got an impression from something and then you had to give your assent to that impression and before you acted on that impression. Or you could give your assent to, um, to that impression. And that, that assent, this, this will, your own volition, was the only thing that you really had any control over. So the entire, one of the, you know, this, the cognitive behavioral, uh, behavioral therapy uh, for the Stoics was to focus primarily in that in that area of training your attention so that you can spot the impression, you can, you can feel it, you can see the kind of judgments that come out, uh, uh, and you can decide whether you agree with that impression or not. Because as they taught, we, we, those, all of these things happen so fast and they're so mixed in people, the, you know, the animal versus the divine nature, that it all happens quickly and you're not even sure what exactly is going on and you're just acting like a slave, a puppet. You're acting like an animal and you're not acting like someone who has you know the the divine uh, spark within them and so you have to practice the discipline of ascent and so you would say that that stoic training was to give you more space to yeah. choose your action Yes, it was create more ener- a more agency for that divine spark. Yes, it was to decide whether the impression you're receiving was true or false, and whether you know how you should act, uh, you know, upon that, you know, that given impression. So, um, John Sellers breaks uh, breaks it down into four different stages. He says, so we first we perceive the external thing, then we form a pretty much involuntary, unconscious value judgment. Um, in most instances, in most instances about that thing, and you can you feel that you know somebody honks at you on the on the road, and immediately you're like, "What's this guy?" You know, angry. You know, if you're really bad, then you've got road rage and you run him off the road. Um, you know, and then clearly, would, would you as a would you consider that person a stoic sage? Did they, <laughs> re, they they reason this out like this is the best way to solve this road rage incident is to make it a thousand times worse for everyone involved? No, that's just acting. That's acting like an animal as the 
the you know Stoic would say. And then uh, the third is that an impression is a proposition formed from a perception and the value judgment that is presented to the guiding principle, which is that divine spark within you. You either assent to and agree with the proposition or you reject it, or you can just withhold judgment. And then properly understood, the indifference of the Stoic to all external things is simply the withholding of assent to value judgments about things that are not up to them. So you just don't give your assent to things that you are, know are outside of your control. And you know that the only thing within your control, truly, is your own mind. So then these things that, um, that will you know, demand your, your emotional reaction or demand some, some sort of action, you decide in that moment or you train yourself so that you can think with a hammer critically and decide, you know, is this the best way of action? Do I even, is this, is this impression even true? What is really going on? You know, is, what is the best course to take? And then clearly the idea of the virtuous Stoic sage or the, the ultimate Stoic sage is someone who would know, you know, who actually would know all of these things. And, you know, the, the progress is, is that, is the in training that attention so that you will you gain the awareness of knowing is this thing in my control? Can I control this? Like you know James Stockdale, he's in a prisoner of war camp. What is within his control? He can't you know he, he can't probably he can't escape. I imagine you know you're tortured, legs broken, you're sick, you're you know you've there's no you you escape. What do you do? Where do you go? You know. But the one thing that he does have in his control is is attitude is the attitude towards the thing. And then also to know that he is still a commander, even within the, um, even within this prison, there is still a chain of command. And as a commander, he should act in a way that's befitting, um, that, that, that dignity that he has for himself. So always to remember that there is a spark of the divine within you, and then always to act as if that is the most important thing and to treat yourself with, you know, the utmost uh, dignity. And I just want to read another quote from Epictetus uh, where he discusses the, the kind of attitude that we should have towards, you know, towards problems and towards all the things that, that happen in life that seem unbelievably insane or crazy or evil. Um, he writes, what do you think Heracles would have amounted to if there had not been a lion like the one which he encountered, and a hydra, and a stag, and a boar, and wicked and brutal men whom he made it his business to drive out and clear away? And what would he have been doing had nothing of the sort existed? Is it not clear that he would have rolled himself up in a blanket and slept? In the first place, then, he would never have become Heracles by slumbering away his whole life in such, in such luxury and ease. But even if he had, of what good would he have been? What would have been the use of those arms of his and of his prowess in general, and his steadfastness and nobility, had not such circumstances and occasions roused and exercised him? Ought he to have prepared these for himself and sought to bring a lion into his own country from somewhere or other and a boar and a hydra? This would have been folly and madness. But since they did exist and were found in the world, they were serviceable as a means of revealing and exercising our Heracles, the divine spark within Heracles. Come then, do you also, now that you are aware of these things, contemplate the faculties which you have, and after comp contemplating, say, bring now, O Zeus, what difficulty thou wilt, for I have an equipment given to me by thee, and resources wherewith to distinguish myself by making use of the things that come to pass. But no, you sit trembling of fear something will happen, and lamenting and grieving and groaning about other things that are happening, and then you blame the gods. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, it's, the, it is a, it's a significant attitude shift that, you know, it, it echoes throughout the centuries. And there was a reason it's, it's fun to listen to the, you know, the rough translation of, of the, trans, or the, the, the scribe who wrote down Epictetus's book, the handbook, because he didn't write it, one of his students did. And it sounds like uh, he said, holy crap, man, we've got to get this guy on parchment. <laughs> And because he did that, can you, you know, say that again? yeah, can you say that again? And so he took he took these sayings down, and he wrote it down, and it was still of use, um, and it's still being used to this day, you know, thousands of years uh, into the future, because it's um, it's something that's fundamental to the human um, to human nature to 
a a certain kind of human nature, the a kind of human nature that that strives uh, to um, excel, to you know, to that is not afraid of seeing their own shortcomings. Mm -hmm. That's not afraid of you know of of of, of that you know that has more of an adventurous yeah. uh, uh, a spark to it. Yeah, and there's a there's an element of heroism, and yeah. courage that yeah. comes out like the even in that quote about Heracles. So basically <laughs> I had this image of Heracles as the, you know, the schlub living in his mom's basement or in, in the, in the recent Avengers movie, you know, when Thor gets Thor. fat, <laughs> yeah, there, what, what would Heracles be if, you know, if he hadn't encountered these, these things and, and that it's almost like a prayer to, to ask the gods or to ask the universe to give, to give me the the challenge right. that that is that fits with my um, my tendencies and my abilities my mm -hmm. capacities. But it's to, also an injunction to temperance. Yes. Like, yes, he, he got himself ready for all these adventures. But what good would it have done if he had brought them to him? Right. You know, it's like go and meet what is in the world, but don't create extra problems just for your own gratification. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's kind of the the line between foolhardiness and and courage, mm -hmm. or the line between just being a you know a total idiot and 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 courage. Because there are a lot of courageous, there are a lot of people with courageous idiots, you know, fake, fake courage, or what passes as courage, but the is Twitter actually mom. just yeah. Well, so speaking of Twitter, the the thing I wanted to bring up this practical thing. It actually wasn't one of his specific exercises. It's uh, under a a topic heading on insults. So he's got a chapter on insults, on putting up with put-downs. So I want to read a page, talk about it, and then give a, a more modern source that gets to the same thing. So he writes, When insulted, people typically become angry. Because angry is a negative emotion that can upset our tranquility, the Stoics thought it worthwhile to develop strategies to prevent insults from angering us, strategies for removing, as it were, the sting of an insult. One of their sting elimination strategies is to pause when insulted, to consider whether what the insulter said is true. If it is, there is little reason to be upset. Suppose, for example, that someone mocks us for being bald when in fact we are bald. Why is it an insult, Seneca asks, to be told what is self-evident? Another sting elimination strategy, suggested by Epictetus, is to pause to consider how well informed the insulter is. He might be saying something bad about us, not because he wants to hurt our feelings, but because his, he sincerely believes what he is saying, or, at any rate, he might simply be reporting how things seem to him. Rather than getting angry at this person for his honesty, we should calmly set him straight. One particularly powerful sting elimination strategy is to consider the source of an insult. If I respect the source, if I value his opinions, then his critical remarks shouldn't upset me, Suppose, for example, that I am learning to play the banjo, and that the person who is criticizing my playing is the skilled musician I have hired as my teacher. In this case, I am paying the teacher to criticize me. It would be utterly foolish under these circumstances for me to respond to his criticisms with hurt feelings. To the contrary, if I am serious about learning the banjo, I would thank him for criticizing me. Suppose, however, that I don't respect the source of an insult. Indeed, suppose that I take him to be a thoroughly contemptible individual, under such circumstances, rather than feeling hurt by his insults, I should feel relieved. If he disapproves of what I am doing, then what, am I, then what I am doing is doubtless the right thing to do. What should worry me is, that, is if this contemptible individual approved of what I was doing. If I say anything at all in response to his insults, the most appropriate comment would be, I'm relieved, to feel, I'm relieved that you feel that way about me, etc., etc., etc. So he goes on. Um, this reminded me, you know, immediately of something I'd read a while ago. Um, this was, uh, this is in a talk from, that Gurdjieff gave. Again, Gurdjieff um, wasn't a, a Stoic um, by, uh, by identification. He didn't identify as a Stoic. Uh, <laughs> but he, he definitely had some Stoic qualities and some Stoic teachings. And I think, I think in his case, he pro you know, he was Greek. He probably... He'd probably read some of the Stoics along the way, um, but if he did, he basically assimilated them for himself and took what he liked, left what he didn't. And this is from a talk that he gave in 1923. Um, it's available in a book called Gurdjieff's Early Talks. 
But this is what he had to say. Um, he uses an initial here, M. I'm just going to say Mike. So Mike called me a fool. Why should I be offended? I don't take offense. Such things do not hurt me. Not because I have no self-love. Maybe I have more self-love than anyone here. Maybe it is this very self-love that has not let me be offended. I think. I reason in a way exactly the reverse of the usual way. He called me a fool. Must he necessarily be wise? He may himself be a fool or a lunatic. One cannot demand wisdom from a child. I cannot demand wisdom from him. His reasoning was foolish. Either someone has said something to him about me, or he formed his own foolish opinion that I am a fool. So much the worse for him. I know that I am not a fool, so it does not offend me. If a fool has called me a fool, I am not affected inside. But if in a given instance I was a fool, and I'm called a fool, I am not hurt, because my task is to not be a fool. So he reminds me. I shall think about it, and perhaps not act foolishly next time. So both just, the, it's the, the exact same strategy for dealing with insults. Is the insult true? Mm -hmm. You know, if so, you know, then thank you for alerting me to my foolishness, which I wasn't aware about. If it's not true, then who cares? That falls into one of those things that you can't control. You can't control the fact that people are going to call you foolish or insult you or make fun of you. That's just, that's on them, right? The only way you can control that is if you eliminate every other person on the planet that might potentially, you know, be a source of insults towards mm -hmm. yourself, which is totally unreasonable. So you're going to be insulted at some point. Someone is going to say something mean about you. Either it's going to be true or it's not going to be true. If it's in your power, like if you were foolish, if it is true, it's in your power to do something about it. If it is not true, it's then basically who cares? Get over it. This is the this is the anti fragile advice that uh, that people are that youngsters those kids these days are not being given mm -hmm. um, b because they they want to live this sheltered existence where no one says anything mean to them, mm -hmm. not realizing that like like I just said you can't eliminate that that's one of those things beyond your control people are going to insult you and if you don't learn to live with it then you're just going to be you know uh, Heracles crying in his basement because his mom hasn't didn't give him his Cheetos you know at the right time while he's playing video games and imagining being a hero when uh, really it would take him getting off his ass and actually doing something to become the hero that he actually was born to be you know that he that he had as this potential within within him that he's not living up to all that uh, what you're talking about with the um the with the insults and, and the the quote from from Gurdjieff, it 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 sounds a lot like back getting back to that cognitive behavioral therapy. It's the you know you you don't let the um, the impulse just run away with you. You don't let the value judgments and the emotions run away with you. You stop. You decide whether you give your assent to this impression. Like this person said something wrong to you, is you know, and then you evaluate the situation. Mm -hmm. It's very much in line with the situational awareness and with um, with cognitive behavioral therapy. And just getting back to that that cognitive chain uh, that I talked about: um, impressions uh, and assent and impulse. Well, Marcus Aurelius uh, he also added a, a fourth one in there. It was uh, impressions impulse or impression ascent desire and impulse because one of the biggest things in in terms of deciding is what do you want and you know what should my attitude be what should my desire be towards this just the the world at large and so i wanted to read this this quote about the discipline of desire True education consists precisely in this, in learning to wish that everything should come about just as it does. And how do things come about, as the one who ordains them has ordained? It is, it is with this order of things in mind that we should approach our education, and not so as to change the existing order of things, for that has not been permitted to us, nor would it be better that it should be, but rather things around us being as they are and as their nature dictates, so that we for our part may keep our will in harmony with whatever comes to pass. And as Marcus Aurelius writes, Everything suits me that suits your designs, O my universe. Nothing is too early or too late for me that is in your own good time. All is fruit for me that your seasons bring, O nature. All proceeds from you, all, subsi all subsists in you, and to you all things return. And as Epictetus writes, 
Some things are within our power, while others are not. Within our power are opinion, motivation, desire, aversion, and in a word, whatever is of our own doing. Not within our power are our body, our property, our reputation, office, and a word, whatever is not of our own doing. So these things... You, if, you, if you place all of your desire and your hopes on these things that are out of your control and you are emotionally invested in them, then, you sh- then as Epictetus would say, you should be expected to just waste your soul for your entire life. <laughs> That's basically uh, what it comes down to. Now, not, that's not to say that you shouldn't care, because one of the big things in Stoic uh, philosophy is the distinction between vices and virtues and indifference. Right? There's things that are evil, and then there's things that are good. There are people that are good, but they probably don't exist. They might be out there somewhere. And if you train hard enough, you maybe someday you could be a virtuous person, but the chances are very slim that you'll ever reach that state. And then there are the great mass of things in everyday life that are just what they would say are indifferent. And that's basically almost everything outside of your control. The Stoic sage teaches that you should be, on some level, you should be indifferent and you should be gratitude and tra- you should be grateful, I mean, and tranquil in facing, and, uh, in facing, in facing the world, these indifference. They include money, wealth, poverty, you know, your station, all the things that Epictetus uh, said, your health, you know, your, your station in life, all, all of these things. Obviously, there are some that are preferred. Um, you prefer to be wealthy over impoverished. You prefer to, you know, be, have, you know, be born into the greatest family and you have the best education. And you prefer, you know, all of these other things for yourself and for others. And that, you know, you, pro- you would probably even work. You're going to work for them because that's just part of, that's within your your control is to actually do these things to make life better for other people. But morally speaking, they are indifferent. What matters is your attitude in doing these things Mm -hmm. and the reason that you're doing these things and how you conduct yourself in, in actually in the everyday world itself. It's a lot like, um, it's a lot like Pink Floyd's machine is the impression that I get. You know, welcome to the machine. That's basically what they're saying is that you're in this world. It doesn't care about you. It's vast. It's crazy. You wanted to control it. You couldn't. It would suck. It would be worse than if you had any control. <laughs> you know, if you had the great control. You don't know. It's, um, you know, this, this great specter of fate really hangs over a lot of, uh, a lot of their uh, theorizing. And, that's, and fate to the Stoics is just uh, cause and effect. It's just this great mass of causes and effects that just keep going and keep going and keep going until the universe dies and then is reborn again. And it's just, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it, for some people they, you know, and it's, I can understand too why people would be a little bit critical of this, of this idea, um, and, you know, of this, well, in this level. I mean, just the idea of indifference in modern times. I think they mistake it though. Yeah. Um, for, you know, one, one of the criticisms of stoicism is this stiff upper lip. I think it's, we live in such a reactionary society that, that the spectacle of somebody actually taking some time to consider what the proper response would be comes across as, as mechanical and stoical and, mm-hmm. and, <clears throat> and it's not valued. Mm-mm. It's not valued at this point. And, and you have the... The other thing about it, I think, too, getting back to what you were saying with uh, the Stoic valuing um, attitude um, as one of their moral virtues is is paying attention to your uh, your attitude, not so much what is going on out in the world. And I'm as y'all are discussing this, I I just can't help but uh, it it brings to mind the postmodern, the prevailing Mm postmodern thought, which just, you know, has spread throughout uh, our culture in various ways. And how just completely inverted, just like everything, mm-hmm. um, from from what you value at, to how you act, uh, is just completely inverted. It doesn't and, matter what you do as long as you believe that you're yeah. <laughs> yeah, my truth. Yes. <laughs> well, the other the other thing too, the other big misconception, you know, especially as as you've been talking about it, is that this this whole idea of a stoic indifference. It, they're not saying don't strive. Right. You know, and I think that's that's a big misconception about stoicism is that you are fatalistic to the point where you you don't act. You just make sure you don't react badly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> I <clears throat> God, um, but they they do count, you know, 
endorse striving. I mean, look at how many great men practiced it, but it mm. was their imbibing of Stoic principles that allowed them to strive in efficient and, and spectacular ways. Mm -hmm. and, and it's what are you striving for, right? That's what is your goal, what is your aim? Um, the, presumably the, the goal of a, a real Stoic is to attain that level of Stoic sagedom or sagehood or whatever you... Or whatever Peterson's competence. Yeah, uh, well, it would be well, higher than that. Well, um, to be able to move through the world yeah. in a sage would, yeah. in essence, be competently, you know, with the maximum good and the minimum harm. Mm-hmm. But like so, that'd be like competently in every dimension possible, mm -hmm. um, and the but with the like with the indifference, um, and that's j just because it sounds it's two words sound the same. It's indifference ts. So like uh, so a plural of indifferent things, um, as opposed to just like a state of indifference. Mm -hmm. So with the indifference, these are the things that kind of that that fall in. The, like you were saying, Corey, in the in the realm of the things that you have no control over and that don't matter, or not not necessarily that you don't have control over, but that don't really matter. Um, sometimes they may th be things that you don't have control over, but there is this this room for maneuvering in the realm of the indifference. It's not like Stoics, like some other philosophies or religions, say like money is evil, so you, ha you so you cannot pursue money whatsoever. It's like no, money is indifferent. You can have it or you can't have it. Um, you can be rich or you can be poor, but you can still be a stoic. Mm -hmm. And it's it's your attitude towards your your wealth or your possessions that determines who you are, not your possessions. So the the wealth itself is an indifferent, um, an indif yeah, an indifferent, which you can pursue to some degree if that's within your power and your inclinations. But again, it's that it's um, it's not straying too far to the left or the right. It's not. Um, being totally uh, not denying yourself so completely that you that you refuse any gifts or or wealth, um, you in, in that case you'd just be insufferable. But uh, and you don't strive to just be to, to acquire as much as possible. You find that middle ground. You you do what's in what's in it to, what's in you to do, and you don't uh, you don't go too far in either direction. You keep that middle ground. Um, but this relates to one of the psychological. Uh, practices that Irvine gets into, which is um, uh, negative visualization. So this is a cool one. <clears throat> one of the techniques is to basically negatively visualize um, situations or visualize a negative situation. So that might be first identifying the things that you value, so it, may, it might be your possessions, and then visualize the situation of you losing those possessions, um, which would which will... Um, theoretically, both make you value what you have more so that you can, you can be more thankful for the good things that you do have, but also less attached to the things that you have because you'll be preparing for, for losing these things which are out of your control because you can lose everything out of your control. It happens mm -hmm. to people all the time. But another one of those is to visualize one's own death um, because that tends to put things in perspective, too, to realize that you will die. Um, this also relates to um, an exercise Gurdjieff gave, too. He, he recommended the exact, well, he recommended something very similar, um, but slightly different. I, I kind of like um, Gurdjieff's a bit more because it's a bit more expansive. I don't know if any Stoics recommended this, but uh, who knows, they might have. What Gurdjieff recommended is to, um, for everyone you meet, everyone you interact with, whenever you interact with them, to realize within yourself that they are going to die someday, that they have loved ones, that they have things and people that they do not want to leave behind and that will, that will basically, that real, imagining this whenever you meet someone will make you feel pity and love for that person. Because you realize that they are another person too, that they that there will be hardships in their life and in their in in the, in the expanded life of the people around them, and he said that by doing that and to, to strive to do that with everyone, that you will develop a love for humanity, a love for the people around you, and that that, that will be real love, as opposed to the thing that we call love, um, which is you know, a pale imitation of that that love for all humanity, and so that. Too is a is a is a stoic practice, and that's it's to it's to take yourself out of the the 
the constant like flux of ordinary life. You know, or, ordinary life has a tempo like a music. You you get entrained in it, and then you you're just like this this thing going along, doing your thing, doing what's what's expected in the moment. But you totally lose perspective, the wider perspective of of what you're doing by getting lost in in those moments. To to engage in reasoning of this sort is to kind of take a step back to 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 look at things from the perspective not of that immediate moment but of the kind of expanded present to to make room for um for that impulse of love that is often lacking when we're just interacting with people the way we ordinarily do every day um just in those minor interactions it's, it's a way of of transforming those everyday moments into something that's actually uh meaningful and and has an effect on your own personal development um, it also relates back to something we talked about in our show that we did on um, the afterlife, oh, ladybugs, um, which was the the putting into practice the idea of there being like a purgatorial state where a uh, life review where you experience all the things you did wrong and with with this um, awareness that you did that you did that what you did was wrong and there was a better way of doing it and the the practice the exercise was to review your life every day at the end of the day this was an, this is another of the, of the stoic practices is daily meditation and by meditation they mean not like um not like zen meditation but um more of like the monastic meditation is to actually think on something meditate in that way more of a cognitive process so um marcus aurelius was that's why his book is called The Meditations, because these are the things he was observing and thinking about and reasoning about within himself about about himself. So that requires first observing yourself. So if you can't observe yourself in the moment, in in the moment, then review the day and remember what you did, and and to see to see where you lived up to what your goals were and where you want to be and who you want to be and the place where you failed, and where you you didn't live up to to what the moment called for uh, according to your um, your vision of you know, your, your ideal self and the, uh, the ideal thing that you would have done in those situations and that so all altogether all of these all of these practices seem to imply and um, and require this separation this self-observation to to see oneself in the moment and in past like in retrospection to see to see oneself from a different perspective, not to be caught up in oneself, but to to separate out, you know, an observer from what is observed, because you need to be able to do that in order to, um, in order to be able to compare, you know, one to the other. You can't compare yourself to an ideal if you can never get out of uh, of of your life and your the your the way you live and the way you see yourself if you can never get out of that then you'll then you have nothing to compare to nothing with which to compare that present to some future or some ideal there needs to be a separation so these are these techniques are a way of doing that it's like and and for the we could go back to the example of the insults when when you are insulted the first reaction is to be offended but the the whole idea here is to create that separation like that space that you're talking about carolyn that that uh, that gap in in the process where before the reaction starts you have the awareness okay that happened this is going to happen i'm going to be feeling this when you can separate that out when you can look at yourself as a like a body that then experiences that insult already that's you're on the first step to not being not taking it personally because you're observing that your body is taking it personally. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I, you know, this me took it personally, but I haven't taken it personally. Mm -hmm. um, the, there, that's a real practical example of that separation between, um, you know, what Gurdjieff, what Gurdjieff would call the real I and it. You know, the the machine, the thing that the thing that responds and um, and reacts, and the so the stoic practices are a way of basically putting that into action and and facilitating that separation to be able to um to you know climb up that ladder to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the stoic sage well, in uh, meditations marcus aurelius kind of pokes fun at some uh at you know his colleagues that would you know, they take 
these nice big vacations and you know to try and get away to get away from like you know the stress of like, like some crazy life know. yeah <laughs> this of crazy Congress. life um, and he says that uh, nothing compares to the inner citadel of of the self that he can withdraw in that he withdrew into whenever he whenever necessary and it was you know obviously through trainings like the like we described through the meditations through um, ob observing the self through uh, awareness and like you pointed out Carolyn through the growing that space so I just want to read a little bit about um, what he wrote um, so you begin by delineating uh, our true nature into three elements body breath and mind body and breath are under our care but outside of our control only the mind is within our control the process of circumscribing the self involves realizing the things outside your control such as you know other people you know the past what the people are saying about you and even you know like the you know your bodily reactions to what is happening and that realizing that those things are incapable of touching your actual self that self is your mind you know that is if you choose, if you have the strength of will to choose and not give your assent to these impressions, then you can choose your own reaction to the situation. You can, whatever that reaction may be. Um, and uh, this realization creates an impenetrable inner citadel within which yourself finds some form of serenity. Um, protected from the vicissitudes of life. This is just one way of, you know, one of the things that he commented that Stoic practices um, enabled him to do in, you know, the life of a of, of an emperor of Rome that I couldn't even, you know, I couldn't possibly imagine the the level of, you know, of stress of of the sort of Damocles or a dagger possibly, you know, in behind every corner and in, in every tunic. Um, they didn't have impeachment. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, we more, don't need a impeachment. A little more direct about it all. <laughs> Impalement. And that's and that's another really critical thing too is that it's um, you know this is you know it does sound a harsh you know for the most part but you have to you know we have to keep in mind that it's the that it's uh, it sounds somewhat catastrophic because those are that's catastrophic times you know the you you just have no idea how long loved ones will live you know and and these stoic philosophers are trying to give people something that will enable them to maintain their integrity in the face of tyrants of vast inequality slavery um, you know rape murder and pillaging constant war the, the you know the fact that even if you're one day your fam you know your family is one of the richest in Rome and then you know 20 years later you might be paupers begging um, you know begging for for money it's you know it's a very much you know it's as topsy-turvy as the world is today you know the the, the times were catastrophic for for many for you know a vast amount of normal people and normal people still want to engage in some kind of work you know what i mean some kind of work that is higher than the you know the the, the worldly work that is offered to them and i think that's why stoicism remains so popular even though it's kind of been scrubbed a little bit i mean from the first two generations of of the stoic philosophers we have like no i don't think we have any writings right. left yeah, i don't think we have any complete writings from the greek stoics yeah just scrubbed from history but still ma uh, maintaining uh, an influence that um that has lasted all the way up to to today that has that has shaped and molded people in such a way and it's and you know primarily through books which is which is you know quite astonishing because typically you think you would only get that kind of a, an impression from an actual teacher but these individuals were just so clear spoken and well thought out that there was you know they you can use all of these handbooks as um as you know actual guides because it, it fits almost every human you know psychology well they wouldn't persist if they didn't work yeah mm -hmm. yeah plain and simple mm -hmm. well one more example of a psychological uh, practice. So this is the one called uh, self-denial or what they, the Stoics called voluntary discomfort. Um, pretty much get an idea just from the name of it. Um, <laughs> uh, it again, it, not going to extremes. So it's not like, uh, it's not like they were, um, self-flagellating or anything like that, but, to to, to get the experience, well, to put yourself into uncomfortable situations just to, um, 
well, maybe do it sometime and then see what the benefit is. So, for example, that might just be something as simple as when it's cold outside, not putting your coat on if you're walking to the mailbox or something, just to feel the cold. Um, or taking a cold shower, for instance, or just doing something, little things like that. And again, Gurdjieff had, did this kind of thing all the time, these self-denials, these little self-sacrifices. So he did it, his motivation was as a way of training yourself. So if you had a goal in mind, a goal for the day, he'd give various, various ways of either rewarding or punishing your body for either attaining or not attaining the goal. So, for example, set yourself a goal in the day, and if you don't meet it, if you don't do it, then you don't eat dinner. Mm-hmm. And you don't, then you can have breakfast the next day, but you don't eat dinner for the rest of the days until you actually do it. And that kind of, that motivates your automatic part, your body to actually get in, get in motion and do it because it wants to eat. Once it does what it's supposed to, okay, you can have a meal. It's like training a dog. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you might, you're probably kinder to your dog, but, <laughs> but your, your body needs to be disciplined. Yeah, and if and if you're used to that because you're already an ascetic, then um, try discrete mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> Teach yourself discrete mathematics every day <laughs> and feel that pain. There's a whole different source of. There's a whole world of pain out there. <laughs> Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> well, another variation is to um, to take something that you like, something that you love, some kind of habit you have. It might be alcohol or smoking. Or um, like something like that, and then again, you deny yourself it until you do what you're supposed to do, until you until you reach that little aim of yours. And it might be it, it, something simple. It's not like okay, I have the 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 goal to earn a million dollars or something. It's not like you quit eating until you make a million dollars. No, it's like it's your goal for the day, right? It's the something. It's, it's the little thing that you've planned. It might be uh, it might be to you know to to. Pay your bills. Pay your bills or, yeah, do, do some small task. Maybe it's to devote 20 minutes to meditating or or to um, devoting 20 minutes or some doing some good deed to the people around you, whatever it is. Whatever you whatever is the, the aim that you've set yourself to then make that the benchmark and then to reward or deny yourself based on meeting that benchmark. Mm-hmm. And that is... As a way of training, <clears throat> tra- training yourself to have self-control, because anyone that anyone that has done anything in their life knows that it's hard to train yourself into new habits. You know, it, mm-hmm. being the new year, I'm sure everyone has tried <laughs> New Year's resolutions, and of course they don't. They never work. You never stick with them. But the and I, it's kind of a trick. It's almost like a self-suggestion because because it takes some effort and some will to punish yourself for not doing for not having will so you you essentially trick yourself into into doing what you plan to do by punishing yourself or by rewarding yourself um it's yeah that just strikes me as kind of interestingly weird that's th- that yeah. kind of reverse psychology mm-hmm. thing where it's like okay well if you don't do what you what you do then do this you know you have a new goal now to punish yourself for not doing what you do so it's a task in itself to punish yourself for what you're for what you're not doing and that just that very process builds will, right? The, and uh, and observing that that what happens, what's going on within you as you as you kind of struggle with yeah. with these things because you're used to doing. I mean, we're all used we we're used to treating ourselves in a in the some way, and that we do it, do it because it's just kind of built into us, you know. Or it's habitual. It's something that, for the most part, we're probably programmed with genetically. And then there's also social things, and we're used to saying yes to different parts of ourselves, like our taste buds or anything that feels good. And we're used to saying no to things that feel pain. But when you start to mix that up, all of a sudden you start to feel all of the weird, all of the other um, aspects of of your of your yourself that aren't in your control and you start to you you know you you put the the hurt on them Mm -hmm. you know you you remind them who's boss maybe that's the right way that the self is in charge and that there is a there's a higher purpose to life and always you know even if it's just small things um to uh to just to always remember that Mm -hmm. but with that, I guess we'll go, we're going to go ahead and wrap up our show. We hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, please uh, subscribe if you liked our show, and then hit like, and we will be back again soon with, with more interesting stuff to talk about. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time.